We are in a spiritual battle, in a spiritual conflict uh, between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Satan and his innumerable demons are always assaulting us. And if they're not assaulting us, they're planning and plotting ways in which they can assault us. Jesus reveals Satan's motives and Satan's goal in John chapter 10 and verse 10. If you want to turn your Bibles to John 10, 10, we're going to see exactly what Satan is up to. John 10, 10 reads like this. The Lord speaking, the thief does not come except or only to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Do you believe that? Do you believe that there is an enemy that exists for the sole purpose to steal, kill, and destroy? Listen, if, if we don't believe that, if we don't believe that reality, if we're indifferent to the reality of there being demonic forces all around us, I would have you know that the devil already has you in the bag or in the net. And one thing we must understand is that Satan doesn't just want us, he wants our loved ones. Satan has one job, and that job is to destroy. Now, the children of God belong to God. We are eternally safe. Our souls are in the hands of God. We are safe. But at the same time, the enemy at times can have a foothold on true born-again believers. At times, the enemy can come into our lives and ravage our lives. He has one job, and that is to destroy. And the contrast of that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, but I have come to give life. Satan has come to kill. I have come to give life. And he gives it more abundantly. And one way in which we can live that abundant life is to overcome the wiles and the trickeries and the temptations of the devil. If you want to live an abundant life, it is growing in his word growing in the knowledge of who God is, being filled and led by the Spirit of God as we learn through His Word, and to be able to say no to the devil. That is what it means to live an abundant life. Not just to know the peace of God, but to enjoy the peace of God, and even to enjoy the power of God over our own sinful desires and over the devil himself. That's what it means to live an abundant life. To not live your whole life under the armpits of the devil, you know. With the devil having us on a chokehold all the time. Not being able to breathe. Not being able to move. Not being able to work for God. The enemy comes to steal our joy. He comes to steal our effectiveness causing us to become useless in the kingdom of God. Do you understand that Satan can paralyze Christians? Satan can render even children of God absolutely useless in spiritual war. It doesn't mean that we're not loved. It doesn't mean that we're not saved. It just means that when we walk around trying to do the Lord's work, the enemy looks at us and says, ah, that, that sheep is no threat. I don't got to worry about so-and-so in the church. He barely even prays. She barely even prays. And so the enemy wants to render us useless. He does this by taking advantage of our sinful desires. And after he takes advantage of our own sinful desires, he makes chains out of them. And he enslaves God's people to their own sinful inclinations. The enemy does that. The devil does that. There are Christians who are free from eternal damnation, but are not free from the clutches of Satan. Even now, many Christians walk around as though they were still enslaved. Satan comes to kill our testimonies. 
He comes to destroy our testimonies. He comes to destroy our marriages, our families, our churches. You see, the enemy again has one job, and that job is to destroy. One thing we need to understand is that Satan never sleeps. And because of that, you and I should never sleep, spiritually speaking. Are you snoozing this morning? You've heard that old line, right? You snooze, you lose. Spiritually speaking, my dear brothers and sisters, if you snooze, you will lose. You will lose something. Satan is after everything, but if you snooze, you will lose something. Maybe it's spiritual effectiveness. Maybe it's a prayer life. Maybe it's a study life. Maybe it's a good witness. Maybe it's a good marriage. Maybe it's a good church. You snooze. Listen to me. You snooze and you will lose something. And there are many, many Christians who lose big. Very big. Don't be one of those, my dear brothers and sisters. Be spiritually alert and awake. Think about how many pastors and Christians altogether does he not have enslaved to the perversions of porn watching. I looked at some polls recently and it turns out that pornography in the church is it's just becoming a regular thing and more and more pastors and leaders are giving into this thing. And listen, this sin is great and it is devastating. And if you find yourself behind that computer tapping on those keys, those are actually chains. And you can be free from them if you submit to the Lord, as we'll see in a moment. But listen, the enemy is having a heyday with m many Christians and much churches and much church leaders, and it renders the church useless. It renders the church powerless. When we give in to the desires of the flesh, when we give in to the temptations of the devil, there's no more power in the pulpit. There's no more power in prayer. There's no more power in witness. Why? Because many are enslaved to their sin. Even true born-again believers are living in this state. And I have come this morning to let you know that you can have victory over Satan. That you can have victory over all the sinful inclinations that you have. Paul makes the reality of the spiritual war very clear in Ephesians, where he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, that is people. We don't wrestle against people. People are not our enemies. There's something behind people. There's, there's demonic forces working behind people. And it says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul makes it very clear. Listen to me. There are demons prowling. There are demonic spirits lurking, looking for ways to paralyze Christians, believers. Because he knows that when we wield the strength of God, the wisdom of the word, we can be a major threat in the kingdom of darkness. He knows that. And so he comes at us. But there is a spiritual war waging church all day, every day. You have a lot to fight for. You have a lot to fight for. You have a lot to protect. And for this reason, in Ephesians, Paul ends with making sure you put on the whole armor of God, not your own armor, not living in your own strength, not leaning on your own understanding and your own ideas. How far does that get us? When Sonny does Sonny, Sonny gets nowhere fast. But when I put on the armor of God, I see victory. I see power. I see overcoming strength. And that's the reason why Paul says, put on the armor of God. Growing in the knowledge of his salvation. Growing in the convictions of biblical and spiritual truth. Standing on the rock, wielding the sword when the enemy comes, knowing the word well enough to fend off evil forces, the lies of this world. So the question is, do you want to be victorious? Do you want to be 
a courageous Christian, and I'm sure some of us here are very victorious and very courageous, but that's not the story of every Christian. It sure wasn't my story when I first got saved. There have been times when I was like a little rag doll in the devil's mouth, like a like an old beat up doll in a pit bull's mouth, just shaking me every which way until I got a hold of the strength of God. Everything changed. And so do we want to be strong? Do we want to be courageous? Do we want to be victorious? It's going to cost you something. This is something you may have never thought of. Maybe some of you have. But do you want to be known in hell? Do you want to be known by demons? Moses was. Remember when Moses died? Satan wrestled with Michael the archangel because he wanted Moses' body to deceive the people? Demons knew who Paul was. Remember the sons of Sceva? They tried to exercise a demon and the demon basically put a whooping on them and sent them all off running naked. And he says, he says, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, but you, who are you? Is that the way Satan sees you this morning? Who are you? Or does he see your devotion to God, the war, the battle in your soul and mind and say, oh, that sister, watch it, devils. That brother, watch it, devils. They're up to something. They care. They fight. They love. They pray. Peter was known in hell. That's why Satan asked if he can sift Peter's life like wheat. Job was known in hell. You remember the book of Job. See, a lot of people... When they hear things like that, that's too extreme. I just want to go to church. And they go back home. Turn everything off. But no. When you come to church, you are being equipped to go back and fight on. Because some of you have children who don't know Christ and will go to hell forever. Are you praying for their salvation? Are you living in such a way that makes them hungry and thirsty for God? Oh, we've got so much to fight for. There are precious souls all around us, my dear friends. Can I get an amen? Amen. You have something to fight for. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 4 and verse 7. James chapter 4 and verse 7 This is how you make the devil run. James 4, 7, therefore, submit to God. Step one, submit to God. Step two, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's the order. You will not experience victory in your life unless you abide by that order. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. First, we submit to God. What does that look like? Well, that looks like submitting to his will. No longer what Sonny wills, but what God wills. It looks like opening the word of God and yielding to it. What does God say about everything? That's what I want. That's what it means to submit to God. It's to render, it's to yield, it's to surrender to what is written. And then it's resist. That is to stand against the devil's temptations. And we all know what it's like to resist something. When you don't want something, you put out your hand, you say, don't want it. Not good for me. Stay away from me. That's what God wants you to do to every inner sinful temptation that arises, to every temptation the enemy throws your way. No, I don't want it. I am God's child. I am God's servant. I don't, I don't need that in my life. And so we simply say no to Satan, yes to God and our sinful inclinations. 
Jesus resisted the devil's temptations. You know the story. The devil was relentless in temptation in the wilderness, right? For 40 days and 40 nights. When you read those passages, it seems like Satan only tempted him three times. But he tempted him many times. For 40 days and 40 nights, nonstop. And how did Jesus overcome the devil? Most people will say he quoted the Bible. Well, that's half the victory. You want me to tell you what gave Jesus the entire victory? He obeyed the Bible. It is written. And so, quoting Scripture and knowing Scripture is valuable. But if you don't obey it, you don't win. Winning is in the obedience to God's Word. That's when the devil flees. Victory is not found in merely knowing the Bible or quoting the Bible, but obeying the Bible. That's how the Lord overcame the enemy. The Lord Jesus went first, and He wanted all of us to follow in His footsteps. He defeated the enemy for us, and He showed us how to defeat the enemy ourselves. He displayed the way in which we overcome the enemy. Luke 4.13 says, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. So it says there, when the devil had ended every temptation, he noticed that he could not overcome the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, no, 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 no. And yes to God so many times that at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, the devil was tired. <laughs> the Son of God's not giving in. I'm out of here. And so the devil left him. He ran out of ideas to try and cause Jesus to fall. And it says that he left until an opportune time. In other words, he's thinking, okay, Jesus, I couldn't get you now. I'm going to get you later. A more opportune time means that in his mind, he's thinking, there's going to be a better time for me to make him fall. And I'll be watching and lurking. And when that opportunity comes, the enemy will strike. And so just know that when you have victories over the enemy, over your own temptations, there are demonic spirits standing back and thinking, we'll get her on another day. We'll get him on another day, in another place, at another time. We know what they're like. We know what their weaknesses are. We know what their cravings are. We know what their character's like. The enemy knows exactly how to attack us. In one sense, he knows us better than we know ourselves. Remember the time when the Lord Jesus, uh, he was ministering to a multitude of people and he was doing miracles left and right, multiplying bread and fish, and the people wanted to crown him as king. What did Jesus do? He left. Satan thought that was a more opportune time. Oh, maybe during the wilderness he will not bow down and he will not give in to my trickery. But at that time, Satan tried to put a crown on Jesus' head. And Jesus ran off. Why? Because Jesus was not to wear a crown of gold just yet. He came to wear a crown of, of thorns first. But Satan thought maybe this is the time. Maybe now he'll cave in. Now that he has multitudes of people that are in awe of him. Didn't work. Jesus says, I have not come to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. You have to think like that. You have to talk like that. You have to walk like that. As the Lord gives you strength. And you will be an overcomer. Practically speaking. So there's the order. The order for victory never changes. I don't know about you, but I like that. <laughs> because I'm a simple guy. Like, just tell me how to win. <laughs> Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Okay, cool. Help me to do that, Lord. I don't got to do anything else. Just step one, step two, and I get the victory. Yes, every time. Keeps it simple. He doesn't make things confusing for us. 
I love that about the Lord. He's very straightforward in his word. Joseph was one who submitted to God and God's word. You remember the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife in the Old Testament? He submitted to God's word. He submitted to God's law. What does God's word say? Do not commit adultery. Commandment number seven. It also says, do not covet your neighbor's wife. Commandment number 10. So when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph, he resisted that temptation, which was most likely a bone, no doubt, tossed by the devil. She tried to lure him in to commit adultery. And you know what he says? He says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Have you ever said that? When you're about to do something you shouldn't do? When you're about to say something you shouldn't say? Oh, you should say this. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That's what it means to submit to God. To think in ways that say, how does this dishonor God? How does this make God look? And that's why I'm not getting into that bed with you, woman. Because you belong to Potiphar, and I belong to God. This is something we should ask ourselves every time when we're tempted to sin against God. How can I? God is too good. God is too great. God is too wonderful. I don't want to dishonor Him with my stupidity. I want to honor Him with my obedience. He is too wonderful. And sometimes, my dear brothers and sisters, it's because of our low view of the majesty of this God that we give in to sin. Because we forget that in one sense, His character is on the line. The enemy will come and accuse God because of our unwillingness to fight. He will mock the Lord. Let's not give him that. Amen? Amen. King David, on the other hand, did not submit to God. You guys know the story very well. He did not resist the devil's temptation, and this was devastating. When David was supposed to be at war, he's on the roof of his house. Gives in to temptation, gives in to what his eyes see. Watch your eyes, men. Watch your eyes, women. And so what happens eventually, this desire turns into a a murderous plot, a sexual deviancy. Eventually, he has Uriah killed, one of his best soldiers, first degree murder. And then he takes his wife, Bathsheba, that is adultery. He breaks two of the Ten Commandments right off the bat. The consequences were just so extremely devastating. There were some severe consequences with David. And listen to me, my dear brothers and sisters. There are consequences to our disobedience to God's Word. There just is. Still loves us. But there are consequences. We will reap what we sow. Can I get an amen? Amen. It happened to David. What happened with him? The Lord took his first child with Bathsheba. Took that boy. That was a consequence. Later on, David's own son, Absalom, attempted to take David's throne. Eventually, Absalom slept with David's wives in public in some tents for everyone to see who is, quote-unquote, the new king. His own son, whom he loved dearly, betrayed his dad. Do you think for a moment that when David was looking at Bathsheba, he thought to himself, oh, this is going to lead to my son wanting to overthrow me. This is going to lead to the death of my next child. This is going to lead to the death of Absalom, the rape of Tamar, his daughter by his own son, Amnon. No, no, no. You see, sin blinds you. The enemy doesn't doesn't show you what's going to follow. He just wants you to focus on the desire right then and there. Doesn't show you the full picture. Doesn't tell you where this will possibly take you and your family. His son Absalom was loved by David. Like you love your sons, loved by David. Put yourselves in his shoes. Eventually, his son Absalom, who loved his hair, 
was caught in a tree by his hair and had three spears driven into his chest. Did David's sin have consequences? Major, major consequences. So don't think for a second that you can just sin on and that nothing bad will happen because of it. Let's be wiser than that. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's be wiser than that. Sin has severe consequences. Never underestimate the damage or sinful desires in Satan's hands can do. Never underestimate what the enemy can do with your sin, your desires. That's why you got to check them. That's why you got to give them to God. What is it? Pride? Check it. Or it will check you. Check me. Men who do not have victory over the enemy simply because they will not submit to God. Instead, they submit to the devil's temptations and their own lustful desires. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. I'm going to start landing this plane very slowly, okay? We're almost done. 1 Peter 5 8 says this, and it's a command, by the way. It's not a suggestion. <laughs> he says, be sober. That word sober means to be serious, to be mindful, to be thoughtful, to be considerate, to be watchful. Like one who's keeping a lookout to see if there's anyone dangerous around and up to no good. To be sober. In other words, don't be intoxicated. Don't be intoxicated with entertainment. Don't be intoxicated with yourself. Don't be intoxicated with drink. Be sober. Listen, it says, be vigilant. That means to be awake and alert always. Why? Because your adversary, it says your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So are you telling me that there's this devil who is like a relentless, hungry lion roaming around wanting to chomp people up? Yes. Don't you see it all around you? Haven't you seen his bite marks in your own life? I have. I have. Be sober means stay focused on those things that matter most. Starting with your relationship with the Lord. Protect your devotion. Protect it with your dear life. Your closeness, your nearness to God. Protect that. Protect it. It will be your power in the times of trial and temptation. Remember in the book of Job, again, when God asks Satan where he is coming from, Satan goes to the throne room of God and God says, where, where you been? Where, where are you coming from? And Satan looks to the Lord and he says, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Listen to me, that's connected to 1 Peter 5 eight. Roaming around, walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What was he telling God? Listen, I'm just doing what I always do. Looking for people to destroy. That's what Satan does. He's always looking. He's always lurking. You're his target. In fact, the children of God are bigger targets than the children of Satan. Did you know that? They're already his in one sense. The Bible says that the whole world is under his control and sway. And sad to say, many Christians are too. But that should not be the case. So then, Satan is a serial killer. Satan, if not resisted, will devour you. He will devour your reputation. He will devour your ministry. He will devour your relationships. He will devour your devotion. He'll devour your effectiveness. He'll devour you. He'll devour your Spouse, he will devour your children. He'll devour your church. He plays for keeps. He plays for keeps. Peter knew this all too well. He knew Satan's tactics. Satan got a hold of Peter's pride, as you know. Before Jesus went to the cross, Peter said, Listen, everybody's going to deny you except me. Pride. 
Not trusting in the Lord's strength, but trusting in his own strength to overcome. Had it not been for the Lord praying for him, he would have been devoured by the enemy. What happened to Peter? Well, he, he denied the Lord three times. Peter, the leader, fell very hard. If Satan can take down the leader of the pack, what makes you think that he cannot take you down? Something to think about. Ephesians 4.27, give no place to the devil. Are you doing anything, thinking anything, feeling anything, plotting anything, desiring anything that the devil can use against you? Give no room to the devil. Give him no place. Don't crack the door. Don't let him in. Give him no room. Why? Because if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. And even more than that. So you have to ask yourself, is there something I'm doing? Is there something I'm thinking? Is there something I'm saying? Is there something I'm involved in that the enemy can use against me to bring me down? In this verse, the context is anger. Anger. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the enemy any room. You know what that verse is pointing to? While you're sleeping, while you're laying down on your comfortable bed with your head on that pillow, and you've got sin brewing in your heart, Satan's working. Satan's plotting. He's got a plan for you. And that's to hurt you. That's to cripple you. Again, King David was in the wrong place at the wrong time, as you guys know, when he was supposed to be in battle. It was the time and the season for the kings to go to battle. He, instead, he's watching Bathsheba bathe. He chose Bathsheba over the battle, and the rest is history. Again, Peter's pride gave place to the devil. Give him no room. Not in your heart, not in your mind, not in your home. Because if you do, you will suffer some consequences. You just will. You just will. So what do we do? We submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. Last verse, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You want to be more than an overcomer? Draw strength from God. Always draw strength from God. Every day, in one sense, every instant, walk in the power of your God. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. No one can defeat him. He's never lost a battle, and he is your God. And he goes before you as a champion. Rely on him. Trust in him. Some might say, well, of course I'm not going to rely on, on my own strength. I'm not dumb. Want me to tell you when we're relying on our own strength? When we're no longer praying. When you don't pray, you say, I am strong enough. And Satan says, oh, perfect target. You have to recognize that you are a weakling. I am a weakling. If it wasn't for the grace of God, if it wasn't for the word of God, the spirit of God, the power of God, you and I would not have a chance with our own sinful desires or with the devil himself. Why do you think the world is in the condition it's in? It's a godless world. It's an, and once it's an unprotected world from the devil. Not fully. And so then, in closing, we need his strength. We need his spirit's power. When Jesus was led into the wilderness, the Bible says he was led by the Spirit. How much do you lean on the power of the Holy Spirit? How much do you pray to the person of the Holy Spirit? That will tell you how much victory you will enjoy on this side of heaven. Let's pray to close.